arithmetic hyperbolic uh, three manifolds and <coughs> So I'll give an example for what uh, the theorem comes down to in a very special case. Um, so, um, so I will work with a field which is Q at join the square root of minus one, and uh, I will use n equals two. So I'm interested somehow in this. I'm interested in the group GL two over this field K. <coughs> and so in this case, locally symmetric space, first of all, the symmetric space itself will be three-dimensional hyperbolic space. And so one model for three-dimensional hyperbolic space uh, would be the complex numbers times the positive reals. And I think of these as terms X, Y, then the hyperbolic structure, the hyperbolic metric is, is given by. Similar formula as for two-dimensional hyperbolic space, you just add a variable. And one can check that the group of isometries is isomorphic to PSL2 of the complex numbers. So that's a group of orientation preserving asymmetries. <coughs> and so we can play the same game as for uh, GL2 of a Q. So we take inside SL2 of the ring of integers in K, uh, a congruent subgroup. And in fact, for some very small technical reasons, I will assume, as I did later on last time, that actually it contains a congruent subgroup uh, of the form gamma one of N. So again, these are the matrices which are congruent to a matrix of this form, modulo n. Okay, and then we form, form this locally symmetric space, which is H3 mod gamma, <coughs> and so these spaces were first studied, so these are called Bianchi manifolds. Um, so they were introduced in, 19, in 1892 by the differential geometrist, Luigi Bianchi. So they're very classical objects, in fact. Um, And in fact, I should say that uh, if gamma is too large, they are not actually manifolds, but only orbifolds, maybe canonically, but if gamma is sufficiently small, they are really uh, manifolds. They are hyperbolic three manifolds. <coughs> and so let me try to draw a picture. And in fact, the picture will look quite similar to the picture uh, for the modular curve. So this time somehow on the bottom, you have the complex numbers and then over it, you have <coughs> hyperbolic three space. And then inside there, inside the complex numbers, you have this lattice given by this ring of integers. And so you will have somewhere zero, somewhere one, somewhere i somewhere one plus i, then you have this. And so I can now again try to draw a fundamental domain and so this time I will t take uh, straight lines above it and then last time I draw, drew these circles which 
by the other boundary. And so this time, these circles will become half spheres. around all of these four points, also here, and I've got a drawing that. And so you see that some of the picture also looks pretty similar to the case of the modular curve. So fundamental domain would somehow be the interior of this cone which goes off to infinity and then <coughs> here it will have some spheres, parts of spheres which bound it. So this is in the case that gamma is the full congruence, the full group SL2. Okay, and so I wanted to make several remarks uh, in which this is situation is very different from the case of the modular curve uh, we looked at last time. So first of all, for obvious reasons, there's no complex structure on this guy. Simply for the reason that it's of odd dimension, so there's no chance. <coughs> and so a fortiori, there can be no algebraic structure. So these are really just hyperbolic three manifolds. And uh, another remark is that uh, in this case there's lots of torsion. So I wrote down one example. So if gamma is a congruent subgroup gamma naught, which just means it uh, just has a zero mod p for some prime p, where p is a prime whose norm is 4969, I think. So it's not all too big, but it turns out in this case a certain 13 digit prime will divide the order of the torsion group subgroup. So take the integral, first integral homology, look at its torsion subgroup, and then there will be huge sporadic primes which divide this. <coughs> and so it is expected, no, no, of course not me. Um, <laughs> uh, so I took this example from uh, the work of Sengun. Um, Uh, it is expected that uh, the order of the torsion subgroup uh, grows exponentially with the volume of this uh, uh, hyperbolic three manifold and in many slight variations of the setup, this is actually a theorem. So, for example, there is a theorem of bergeron venkatesh which works in a slight variation of the setup where this hyperbolic three manifold would be compact. And maybe they also introduce some coefficient system. But <coughs> and also there's an Iwasawa theoretic uh, argument which produces lots of torsion. So it's known that there's a lot of torsion but apart from that, very little is known about, about this torsion. So one knows that it's there, there's a whole lot of it, but that was mostly what one knew. <coughs> uh, nonetheless, the following theorem was expected to be true for a long time. So 
the rough form is the following. So assume that the mod P homology is non-zero for some group gamma. I mean, it's a very weak form, which is probably trivial in the way I stated it, but I will refine it so that uh, there's really content to it. Uh, there exists some Galois representation uh, of the absolute Galois group of this imaginary quadratic field going to PL2. Uh, which is unramified outside this level n where I choose my n there. Right. With certain properties that I'm about to explain. Uh, so, that such a result could be true was expected since, I guess, the 1970s, so there were, were examples of Fritz Grunewald, which somehow gave numerical evidence that <coughs> if there is such a torsion class in the homology, then there is some Galois representation which seems to be attached to it in some sense. And I guess a precise conjecture. Because this is GL2. <laughs> so in general, there's a locally symmetric space for GLN on which some of GLN would act. And you would divide by a congruent subgroup of GLN of this and then you would expect representations into GLN. But, I mean, at this point, it's totally mysterious because this picture on these black spots has not, doesn't have anything to do with skull representation. It's just real topology. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, at this point, you could just take the trivial representation and just be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, the precise conjecture which was put forward, for example, by Ash in 1990. So, uh, for a more precise formulation, uh, I have to talk about heck operators. <coughs> and it is because, so it's really crucial that I work with congruence subgroups here and some of the way this congruence property is used is that it's possible to define Hecker operators. So how does this work? So take some prime idea in the string of integers, not dividing n, prime idea. And I carefully chose an imaginary quadratic field for which all of these are principles. So uh, it's generated by some element. Uh, in the ring of integers. And then I can look at the following subgroup. So I intersect my congruent subgroup gamma with certain conjugates of it. And <coughs> uh, then I can look at the following correspondence between the arithmetic manifold I'm interested in, and it will again go towards it and in between, you take a finite cover. So this first projection is just the obvious projection between because this is a subgroup of gamma. And for the other projection, you first identify this with the 
the quotient by a conjugate subgroup. And then this conjugate subgroup, uh, gamma will be, again, a subgroup. And so you can now project again to this guy. So pi 1 and pi 2 are finite covering maps. Um, and so what you can do with these covering maps is you can define, I mean, any correspondence somewhere X on the homology. What you do is you pull back and then you push forward, whereas this second map uses that you have a finite covering map, so you can define a push forward map on homology. So this gives you an endomorphism of this homology group in NKC. The fact is that these endomorphisms for P0 dividing N uh, commute. Uh, sorry, yes, so this P has nothing to do with this P. Uh, I'm sorry, this cause of confusion. Um, um, Right, so this implies uh, that there exists a basis of simultaneous, well, there exists a simultaneous eigenvector. Uh, yeah, I mean, I should really say we simplify to, I mean, I don't, I don't say there's a basis of simultaneous eigenvectors, but uh, for, <laughs> but somehow for any system, well, it exists simultaneous eigenvectors, and I will just talk about those which are eigenvectors. Some are good enough. Um, and uh, so the more precise form of the theorem is the following. Uh, so let alpha be... These alpha p's are numbers in fp bar. Uh, be a system of Hecker eigenvalues. Uh, appearing in such a homology group. So yeah, I go to an algebraic closure to see all of them. <coughs> then there exists a representation rho alpha which goes from the absolute gamma group of k to gl2 fp bar which has the following property um, that if you take the trace of a Frobenius element corresponding to this P. So, oh, I should say it's unramified outside in. Uh, is given uh, by the Hecker eigenvalue. So, Definition I don't really want to recall, but <coughs> um, <coughs> uh, 
Oh, so, yes. Yes, 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 thank you. Okay, here we are. Um, uh, suffice to say that by Shimo Tarov density theorem, these Frobenius elements are dense in the subgroup, so giving the traces, essentially, at least if P is larger than 2, maybe, uh, determines this representation. Yes, I can decide what the determinant is. I mean, I would have to introduce a canonical character to this, and it would also match up. So, uh, in my paper, I really identify the characteristic polynomials of Frobenius in general. <coughs> so, the theorem somehow tells us that um, these Hecker eigenvalues, which you get from this hyperbolic three manifold, see information about Galois representations, although a priori the situation has no connection. And so, yes, so I should say that this is somehow, this should be considered as a mod p version of one direction of the Langlands conjectures. So if you would consider homology of this guy with complex coefficients, and what you would see are certain automorphic representations of uh, GL2 over this imaginary quadratic field. And for those, it was proved by Harris, Lund, Taylor, and Soren recently uh, that you have the attached Galois representation. And so if it so happens that uh, this class mod P lifts to a characteristic zero class, then one can get these Galois representations simply by reducing their Galois representations mod P. And so my theorem is somehow about the case where this is somehow an actual torsion class, so it does not lift to characteristic zero. Um. So somehow because there exist very big sporadic primes, uh, for which this, there is some actual torsion. This means that there are also some, this gives examples of very large sporadic Galois representations which are unramified at only a few primes. Some are really about certain sporadic phenomena. Oh. And so, uh, oh, I should use this blackboard. Um, In the rest of today's lecture, I want to just give an example of what this means. So, the concrete Hecker eigenvalue system and the concrete Galois representation attached to it. And so I took the example from the thesis of Figueredo. And so in this example, I'm considering uh, mod 3 homology, so P is 3, and uh, I identify the field with three elements with 0 and plus minus 1. And I look at the following congruent subgroup. Gamma is gamma 1 at 3 intersected with gamma naught at 61. So it's those gamma such that gamma is congruent to star star 0, 1, mod 3, and congruent to star star 0, star, mod 61. So I allow ramification at 2 primes, 3 and 61. Well, actually, 61 should be regarded as 2 primes because it's factors as product of 2 primes in this imaginary quadratic field. And uh, I will also use that this is contained in a slightly larger group which is gamma naught 3 intersected gamma naught 61. So I hope you can guess what this means. Um, and so uh, this is a normal subgroup. And the quotient is just given by this diagonal element here. So it's just S3 cross 
and I will denote the identity character to f3 cross by pi. Okay, and so I will look at the following homology group. So I will look at the H1, H3 modulus this congruent subgroup gamma with coefficients in F3. <coughs> and acting on it, because gamma is normal and gamma tilde, I have this quotient gamma tilde over gamma. And so I take the eigenspace for this character chi, and that's also called fixing the nebentypus. Take the part neben typus chi. And so this guy will have dimension two over F3. And there are two eigenvalue systems. Alpha one and alpha two. And so you can just go about computing them. And I will tell you the result. Oops. OK, so what does this blackboard mean? So, uh, so for any prime which does not divide the level, which is 3 and 61, and this I'm working about 3, so 3 is already there. <coughs> For each such prime, I can look at the Hecker operator to achieve P. And uh, the corresponding Hecker eigenvalues are denoted here for alpha 1 and alpha 2. <coughs> and I've written in the same line um, those primes which have the same norm. And it's not a priori clear that they will have the same Hecker eigenvalue. Uh, but they do in this case, in all these examples somehow. And to save space, I've denoted them in the same line. So uh, we can make a couple of observations uh, about these numbers. So the first thing is what I just said, that if I have two primes which have the same norm, so the norm is just the square of the absolute value in this case, um, and then they will have the same eigenvalue. So that alpha i p is always equal to alpha i p bar, where i is either one or two. And then there is another thing that happens, namely alpha one seems to be zero exactly when alpha two is zero. this blackboard for a moment. Um, or maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should do this. <laughs> okay, so what does the theorem tell us? So the theorem implies that there should exist somewhere representations rho i, rho 1, and rho 2 of the absolute Gaia group with values in GL2 F3. A priori in GL2 F3 bar, because, but because it, it appears that, well, in this case it's actually true that all these alphas will lie in F3, so the trace is always in the subfield F3, and this implies that also the representation is defined over F3 already. So we get representations actually into GL2 F3. 
uh, as Delim was asking, I can identify uh, the determinant of this representation. And because I fixed this name tuples, uh, actually the determinant of this representation will be trivial. So this is the tuple here. Name tuples chi. <coughs> so actually, they are mapping to SL2F3. And they are unramified outside 3 and 61. And which have this property for the Sibelius eigenvalue. Uh, let's make the following remark. Um, if chi 3 is a mod 3 cyclotomic character, So this is simply measuring the action on the two non-trivial third suits of unity. Um, this, is un uh, this is ramified only at three. <coughs> and this means that if I twist my representation row one with this character, it will still have all the properties that it should have. And so one might ask whether actually the second representation is just this twist of the first representation by chi 3. And in this dictionary, this would mean that alpha 1 times chi 3 of a Fubinius element should be the same as alpha 2 fp. And so uh, let's write down what chi 3 of a Fubinius element would be. And by the way, that's by quadratic reciprocity, this is one if the norm of phi is one mod three, and minus one if the norm of phi is two mod three. Um, so it's easy to compute, and uh, it turns out that it works out. Let's uh, check here if it's minus one again, I hope, yes. Then when we have a zero, we don't really know what to expect, but anyway, but at all points, at the all data points where there should be some correlation, it works out. So this seems to be actually true. <coughs> and actually, this relation is something you can actually prove by hand, even if you wouldn't know. I mean, this relation that alpha 1 is equal to this relation here with this formula, something you can actually just prove directly without knowing the existence of the dynamic. Okay, but let's try to figure out actually what this, so as this differ just by a twist, we can somehow now concentrate on row one and ask what row one actually is. So, let's move one page. So concentrate on. So I recall that this is a map from the absolute Gara group of K to SL2F3. And actually SL2F3 is, it has, oh, I don't remember how many elements, but quite a few. So uh, let's rather look at uh, the re reduction row bar, which goes to PSL2F3. And now that's just a well-known group. It's just the alternating group on four. 
And so what does this correspond to? So under this Galois theory correspondence, this corresponds to a degree four extension. Uh, I called it L rho bar over K. Unramified outside sphere in 61. Such that its Galois closure will have Galois group A4. And so that's uh, given by some degree four polynomial uh, called P of X. Where the AIs so you get this extension L rho bar by joining a root of some Uh, the roots of some, a root of some degree four polynomial. <coughs> and so what we know is a strange relation between the trace of this uh, representation evaluated at the Frobenius elements and these alpha p's. And so the following lemma uh, gives a concrete consequence of this. So the following are equivalent. In some sense, P has reduced form. Uh, which means that no extra primes divide uh, the determinant of this particular polynomial. Um, the first is that P has a root mod P. So there exists some um, x and the adjoint i such that p of x is maybe not zero, but it's zero mod p. Um, by the definition of Frobenius elements, uh, one sees easily that this is equivalent to the Frobenius as an element in A4 uh, having a fixed point. One, two, three, four. So well, the action of Frobenius describes how mod p, the p's power will act on these four roots of this polynomial. And that it has a fixed point means that there is one which is actually defined over the base sphere. <coughs> then it's an easy exercise in making this isomorphism very explicit that this means that the Frobenius element as an element in PSL2F3 is a unipotent element. And this is finally equivalent to a property uh, as we want. So this is equivalent to the trace of Rob P considered as an element in SL2F3 or the trace, I should say, of this row bar, of row of rho p uh, being plus or minus one. So we get a, the following corollary that there exists some polynomial such that uh, alpha 1p, say, is non-zero if and only if p has a root mod p. Okay, so this means that 
the strange behavior of when this is zero or one is some of the same strange behavior as some polynomial having a root modulus this prime ideal. And in fact, one can make a guess for what this polynomial should be. There exists a unique degree four extension L of Q uh, unramified outside three and 61 and whose Galois closure has Galois group A4. And that corresponds to the polynomial x to the four minus seven x squared minus three x plus one. And so it might be that this field we're interested in is actually just a compositum of this with this field k. This would also explain uh, the strange property that uh, this doesn't, didn't see whether we take p or p bar because actually the representation is already defined of a q. And so now we can numerically test uh, um, test this relation. So we took, look at this polynomial mod p and we find that, so in this case alpha one is non-zero, so we expect that it has a root and indeed it factors as a linear polynomial and this polynomial. In the second case again alpha is non-zero, so we expect that there is a root, and indeed there is a root. And it continues like this. So in this case, x equal to z six will be a solution. In the next case, x equal to two is a solution. Then x equal to eight is a solution. Then there is no solution. Again, there is no solution. And then x is equal to minus three. And then again, no solution. Okay. So, I mean, even in the examples, like this example of Picaredo, where um, one had such a concrete polynomial and these concrete Hecker eigenvalues and see that someone numerically they matched up, one couldn't prove that there was any relation. When Quinn proves that this is somewhat continuous forever, this relationship. Because yeah, even if you know what to expect, you couldn't somehow make any relation. Um, now that we know that there is some Galois representation, somewhat checking this is just a finite computation. So if there are only finitely many possible Galois representations that it might be, some of we can rule out one by one until we see uh, it has to be this one, and then for this one, it actually has to continue forever. So because I'm com bad in computer algebra systems, I didn't actually make the check that in this case it's really this polynomial, but um, it should be okay. <laughs> and No, I mean, I guess you have to compute further, maybe. I don't know. Well, maybe it's even enough, so. Uh. Okay. Uh-huh. 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 I mean, how far do you have to go roughly? Do you know this? <laughs> Um, so to end this lecture, I want to make some uh, more remarks uh, on this precise example.
I mean, but Figueredo also writes that he has tested this for like 100 primes or so. so. I mean, that's only the data that I found in the paper. So. Um, um, so this polynomial P that we considered it somewhat corresponds actually to, uh, let's call this rho naught. So it's actually defined on the absolute Galois group of Q already and uh, with value is still in SL2, that's true. And it is an even representation, which means that the determinant of rho zero of complex conjugation So I define Q bar as a subfield of C on C of complex conjugation and then this is an automorphism of Q bar. Yes, you can. I mean, a priori, some of this P gives only a representation to PSL2 F3 and you can check that it actually lifts to SL2 F3. Uh, which is an even representation. <coughs> And so, in this case, the, and uh, if you want, you can even lift this. Uh, to a complex valued representation. Because there's a lift from GL2 F3 into GL2 C um, as groups. <coughs> And so this should conjecturally, well, actually in this case, it's a theorem of, uh, because the group is solvable, it's a theorem of Langlands tunnel. Ah, what? Do I get this right? Well, at least it's a conjecture that it is associated to uh, a certain mass form eigenvalue a quarter. So to s okay, I, I've, I I wasn't sure. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I wasn't sure whether it's only a theorem for weight one forms. You can, I think you can make examples, yes, uh, that, okay, let me explain what's happened. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, so there is some kind of automorphic object, which is a non-holomorphic modular form. So this is a non-holomorphic <coughs> forms on this modular curve, H2 mod sorry, gamma. Uh, Uh, but they don't contribute in any way to the homology of the modular curve. Uh, so the diagram now is the following. So, so you have somewhere these mass forms of eigenvalue a quarter. And in general, it is absolutely not known uh, that there exists Galois representation attached to them, which actually should go to SL2C. And these are all even, yes. Uh, wait, no, sorry. It's just representation of GL to C, but it's even. Um, but then you can make this the following. So you can restrict this to K. So you get some more restricted to K. Yeah. 
And <coughs> now there is no even odd distinction anymore because you're over in the imaginary quadratic field, so complex conjugation is not there anymore. Um, and so by Sayers conjecture, Uh, you expect that you can go back and find p torsion in normology H3 mod gamma where I join some level at p. And that's actually numerically tested here in precisely such example. any p. So you can reduce this representation to GL2 fp bar for any p. And then maybe you have to increase the level at p a bit, but then it can contribute some, some p torsion in the integral homology. And so No, I don't think so. Gamma P and FP are the same, yes. So it's P torsion in this guy. Um, so there should be some reason. So let me formulate this question. Is there an analytic reason that a mass form on some level gamma n uh, gamma n and eigenvalue a quarter uh, forces p torsion in the first homology of now so this is on the modular curve, and it somehow it should force p torsion on gamma n times p in this group. So this is somehow numerically tested to be true. So somehow there has to be some strange reason that such a mass form, some purely I don't know, some analytic object, gives rise to torsion suddenly after you went to this imaginary quadratic field. And one doesn't in general expect it to be liftable, no. Yeah. This really, ha yeah, there are examples where this is verified. Well, I mean, the Betty number, yes, might get be zero, but I mean, there, there's some torsion in there. I, th I think, it might, yeah. And I mean, if if one if there would be, the answer to this question would be yes, and would I, I think one ha would have a very good chance of constructing these Gower representation that one expects to mass forms because if one has these classes in the mod p homology of these arithmetic uh, threefolds, um, then one, by the theorem, one would get some Galois representations for all p, and then maybe by an argument similarly as in the lean chair, one might maybe be able to patch them to the expected even uh, arting representation. I, there are examples even for like, what five or something? No, I mean I'm not constructing any. No, I mean it, uh, I mean even if I say that this has been numerically tested, I mean I only say that there are hundreds of Frobenius eigenvalues which match. Okay. 
Maybe I stop here today and the next time I will say something about the tool.